Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of an Alec TV live stream. I'm Katherine Mortensen from the American Legislative Exchange Council studios here in Crystal City, Virginia. And joining me remotely is Cindy Circatella. She is the executive director of a really exciting group um, that I, well, I'm excited to tell you about. It's called America's Future. If you're not familiar with it, we're going to learn all about it today and how young people can get involved in helping this shape and, and be part of the conversation on preserving freedom and limited government and um, free markets. So Cindy, welcome to our live stream. And I'll just first ask you a little bit about America's future, just so people will know what your group is doing. Uh, if they're not familiar with you, we want them to understand what your great group is doing. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a really great honor uh, to join you today. We love the work that you guys are all doing across the country. Uh, hello, everyone. It's great to see you. My name is Cindy Circatella with America's Future. We, in we're, we are an organization that was founded in 1995 in Washington, D.C. by a bunch of young people who wanted to be wonks, wanted to be influencers before that was really a phrase, uh, and wanted to work hard to limit government. And they wanted to challenge themselves to build a better network and build the skills they needed to be able to take a national stage. And so for uh, over 10 years, well, I guess it's been 20, 25, 26 at this point, uh, we've really been an organization that wants to help build the next generation of freedoms leaders. We see an important opportunity for young people to build a support network because this can be lonely work and scary work because our ideas are not always so popular. And we want to make sure that they have the skills that they need to really take the lead when they have that opportunity, whether that is through uh, being great writers and publishing in the media, whether that is running free market think tanks, or it's being a business leader or a community leader. We want to make sure they have those skills. And so we do that uh, all across the country through both in-person events and online programming. But I'm happy to tell you any more that I can. Well, Cindy, you already have a fan commenting. Lawrence Gilhini he <laughs> says, Cindy is one of the best people working in Liberty. Her ideas are going to revolutionize the future of free market thought by creating the next generation of leaders. She's incredible. If you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, feel free to join in and comment or ask a question. Um, so thanks, Lawrence, for being a part of the conversation today. Larry so is said, one of those great, uh, just to tell you, Larry, who uh, commented, is one of the great leaders that we work with. He is leading the charge in Rhode Island, which is a brave place to be, uh, and taking our organization to Maine and New York City. And so he's someone that I think is important for all of us to watch to see what he does in the future. Yeah, Cindy, you said that um, you have really been growing recently. Um, you have 10 city-based chapters and five mm -hmm. regional hubs. Yeah. Tell me kind of where your numbers are, where your strengths are around the country. Absolutely. And so we want to make sure that we are an op we are available to young people wherever they are. But we find that in particular cities are a great place to be because that's where they want to go. Uh, and so we have events that are happening every month in 10 cities across the country. And that is along the East Coast and the Midwest. Uh, and then after 2020, when it was illegal to host events in person, we had to kind of reorient our work. And we took a look and saw that some of our chapters were really just there was a ton of potential. The leaders there were great, were performing in amazing ways. And so we converted those into regional hubs. And so their job is to both host events in their cities, as well as uh, to reach out and uh, talk about our ideas and host events in states and cities all around the area. And so that has helped us to expand within uh, the New England area, as well as in the West. Uh, we have a great hub in Phoenix, and they've been hosting events in Denver and Las Vegas. Uh, and then this year, actually, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be hosting our opening our fifth regional hub in California so that we'll be able to start hosting events all across the state there. But our goal is to reach major cities where there are young people all around the country. And then we have a virtual level membership and a bunch of different programming so that if you're not with us in person, we still have the opportunity for you to engage and get connected with the national movement. Well, there were two things that caught my attention there. You noted that you're growing in New England and also mm -hmm. in California. Um, I'm aware that recent polls show that young people in New England are increasingly embracing conservative values. There's a growing number of conservatives, uh, the young people, especially in New England. 
What do you think is going on in that part of the country? Is there anything unique there? The thing that I have learned uh, is that it's probably a bit of a pushback to the major progressive agenda that has been there. Um, yeah. New England is one of the most uh, progressive areas in our country, and they have been trying out from actually what Larry has told me, a lot of different policies that are a bit more radical, they're testing out there. And I tend to believe that limited government, it, well, I think we all share this belief that limited government and setting people free is the best way to increase prosperity and to give people flourishing lives. And when our government makes rules and regulations that hold that back, we're not going to have a great outcome. Our lives are going to be less than. And my hope is that people are seeing that result through that negative regulation and pushing back. Um, I also would love to think that the work that we're doing there is pulling people together and giving them a voice because it can be scary to stand up and, st and to declare your ideas there. So I'm glad to hear that you're seeing those polls and we're going to hopefully continue to make that grow. Right. Well, it's really exciting also to hear that you're growing in California, of course, and perhaps California, there's similar dynamics at play as in New England. Yes. Yeah. My, yeah. The way that we thought about it is it's uh, California is a huge state. It's an intimidating task, but they really form the future with America, whether it's policy or culture or business. They are really setting the tone. And if we're not there, then our voices are never heard. Um, and the same, just as you said, I think that California is going to see the negative outcome of a lot of the regulation. Uh, that they have put in place, and they're going to be looking for new solutions. We want to make sure young people are ready uh, to take on those leadership positions when people want to hear it. And so we are launching that next week, actually. Uh, we have an event in San Diego on May 19th, and then an event in Sacramento on May 24th, so that we can show that we're going to be active across the state, and we're getting ready to start bringing people together and getting them ready to go. And then, of course, your big event, I think, is your, your gala coming up at the end yeah. of March, and I'm going to put up a screen here that shows your website so people can see kind of what you're doing, what's happening with America's future. Just stand by and I will get this. Well, let's see. So it looks like the screen I'm showing is your Buckley Award, 2022 Buckley Awards. But that is tied in with your gala, right, coming up in, in May? Yes, our gala is on May 26th. It is our annual gala and award showcase. So we'll be, we will be announcing our Buckley Award winners this year, as well as two great writing winners um, and a brand new prize that we're launching this year called the Local Leader Award, which uh, will highlight young people who are taking civic action within their communities. Um, but the Buckley Award is something that we have been running for about five years, but it predates us. The Young Conservative Coalition uh, founded that award. So it's been around for 13, 14 years. And it's an opportunity to really highlight the great work that young people under 40 are doing to advance freedom. And so we have the honor of celebrating young people, giving them a national stage, and really inspiring other young people to know that they can make a difference and they can make a change. And this is a great way for us to do that. So we'll be announcing the winners that evening. Oh, I see. The winners will be announced at your gala in May. Right. Yeah. And so open nominations are open now. And I believe, what is the age, 22 to 40? Correct, yes. Are there any past winners that we might know names or, I mean, just, or who, what's a typical winner look like or what are they doing? How? So with these awards, we like to highlight young people who sometimes don't get the credit that they should uh, because maybe they have a slightly different position or young people who have really taken a, uh, an impressive stand and have made it out. So people that you might know uh, are Karen Agnes, who is the founder of the Network of Enlightened Women, Daniel Ersbermer, who is the head of the Pelican Institute down in New Orleans, Austin Berg, who is the vice president at Ironlight, who does marketing and communications. Others are Corey DeAngelis, who is an amazing uh, influencer on the topic of school choice and education. Um, I can list a long list, um, but basically the essential winner is a young person who has really stood up and wanted to make a difference uh, within their community or across the country to advance the ideas of liberty. Sometimes that means they have to take a stand that is unpopular and they have to face kind of like a firestorm. Other times it's uh, helping people to understand a policy or an idea. And really, our hope is, is that we can draw attention to people who might not always get a national spotlight, who may not always be on TV. Although we also want to celebrate the ones who are on TV because they're getting the word out to massive audiences. I um, do. Rec yeah. 
Cindy, I do recognize some of those names that you just mentioned of past winners that are definitely people who are real movers and shakers in the conservative world. Mm -hmm. So good to them or good for them. Um, And the other thing I I noticed as you were listing off some of those winners is they're not all from D.C. or sort of the eastern seaboard hub. It sounds Mm -hmm. like you really look for people from all over the country. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, Washington, D.C. is a central place and people are doing great work here to try to push back on government. But amazing work is being done all around the country. And we are a truly national organization. And so we want to make sure that we represent that Um, because what happens in the states makes its way to D.C. eventually. And so making sure that we show the young leaders who are active across the country, I think is really important. And it's important for young people to know that they don't have to come to DC to make a difference. There's so much they can do right where they are uh, to affect their communities and their towns and their cities and the state. And so highlighting those people, I think can help inspire those people as well. And one of the programs you um, told me about earlier, I I was very interested in, it's you're trying to teach young people how to push back against media bias, which is so prevalent, as you know. Um, Tell me about that program. Absolutely. And thank you so much for the chance to do that. We actually just finished up our first cohort last week uh, and celebrated the first class for this year, 2022. Um, But our Writing Fellows program is a six week long program where we take young journalists or people who want to improve their writing skills and we teach them how to write a great op ed how to write a great headline, and even more importantly, how to pitch their stories in order to get them published. And this program is taught by editors and journalists and people who are actively in the field, which is really fantastic because it means these students now have access to the people who could publish their work. Um, But we try to make it really hands-on. We teach them how to have a voice, how to be bold, and how to really have a great reasoned argument. And what we find is that if we give people these skills, they're ready to take them. Um, We had our alumni just last year published over 11,000 articles in media from um, the USA Today to local newspapers. And the thought that we have is that the more young people that we have who believe in the values of freedom, the more we have them writing about anything, the better, because then our worldview is able to be kind of built in and shown how it fits into the entire conversation, not just on politics. Um, So we run that program two times a year. It is led by uh, a great editor named Matt Purple, who helps us put that together. And currently you can apply if you're interested, uh, if you're a young journalist for our fall cohort, which will take place in September and October. And is it a program that people can participate in remotely or is it on site? Is there a cost involved? Uh, there is no cost involved. We have wonderful, generous donors, who meet, which means that we can offer this free, this service free. Uh, but I'm really glad you asked that. We offer the program vo- both virtually and uh, in our offices here in Washington, D.C. So if you're in the D.C. area, you can come in person. But otherwise, we have a we take advantage of Zoom and StreamYard and things like that to bring the class to them as well. Well, I am just so grateful for what you're doing. And those numbers are impressive. Eleven thousand piece of op-eds or columns Mm -hmm. out there. That's really a big deal. I I, I work in that space and I know how hard it is to get guest columns placed and there's just a limited space and so many voices. So good for you. You guys are really, really doing well there. Good for them. They're all very prolific writers. So we're really happy that they're getting their message out. I love that. And um, the next thing I want to ask you about, Cindy, is just sort of your own background. How did you come to be a part of the conservative movement? Is it something that you have grown up with from childhood or did you pick it up in college as a young Republican? How did you what does your journey look like? Yeah, so I was very fortunate to grow up with conservative parents, uh, especially my dad. He loved to give me things to read and to listen to. Um, And I was just always very inspired by the story of America's founding and our founding principles of all men are created equal and we have the right, uh, the rights that we do. And so that was always something that I was really inspired by. Um, and then I moved to Hungary. I had the great chance to move to Budapest, Hungary when I was in high school. And there I got a first eye, a bird's eye view, a front row seat to the city and the country as it was coming out of communism. And I saw what communism did. Um, and that really lit a fire under me to wanna do whatever that I could to keep people from having to live that way again. Um, And so I went to Hillsdale College. I studied political economics. I fell in love with economics and uh, public choice and all of that. 
and came out to Washington, D.C. and got a job with the Atlas Network, uh, where I helped work with brand new think tanks that were getting started all over the world who were working to advance freedom. And I ran their training programs for, I think I was at Atlas for about 13 years. Um, but the really key piece of this whole, so I've had the, the fortunate uh, opportunity to do a job that I love and to make a difference in the world, which I think is something that many people in my generation want and something that I hope we can touch on a little bit more. Um, but I came to AF as a young person who needed more connections, wanted to gain new skills and needed some money to help pay my student loans. <laughs> and so I, I planned events for uh, Washington DC's America's Future chapter uh, for a few years. And that was a great jump start for my career. And so in 2018, I came back to lead the organization. Well, I love your story. I, I mean, obviously the firsthand experience um, at the, the fall of, you know, communism and, and seeing that, um, yeah. Yeah, that, that must have really changed you and made a profound impact on you for sure. Yeah. And um, next, what I want to talk to you about is we were talking about young people and, and the, the people you're working with today. There was an article that caught my attention a few weeks ago in Vox News, and I want to share it with you. And basically, the gist of this article is young people today, and the title is um, Do Not Dream of Labor. That it, it's, it's a clever title and it comes off of a meme that is, is going around on the internet right now, or most, mostly it's going around on the like TikTok and uh, um, Instagram. Right. But Gen Z does not dream of labor. And let's talk about this. On TikTok and online, the youngest workers are rejecting work as we know it. How will that play out in IRL, which is... <laughs> in real life. I had to ask, ask my daughter what that meant. Um, and then, then, then the article goes on to, to say here, um, many young people today have taken to declaring they don't have dream jobs since they quote, don't dream of labor. This is a buzzy phrase popularized on social media. Um, the, to quote the billionaire Kim Kardashian, it does seem like nobody wants to work these days. Nobody wants to work in jobs where they are underpaid, underappreciated, and overworked, especially not young people. So let's check out a video here. Oops, I got the wrong. Let me pull up a video screen. Oops, daisies. Give me a second and I'll get that right. I want to show one of these uh, social media videos that I'm talking about here. It's, on, it's funny. On TikTok. Okay. Darling, I've told you several times before, I have no dream job. I do not dream of labor. So tell us, what's your dream job? Darling, I've told you several times before, I have no dream job. I do not dream of labor. All right, you get... Yeah, you get the idea. There's just thousands of these videos. They're all using that same audio clip. And uh, so the Vox article is saying, asking the question, what is really going on with young people today? Mm -hmm. And um, obviously from my generation, I'm Gen X, I'm a little shocked. Um, but is that even an accurate representation? Like, is that what you're seeing with the young people in America's future? I would say no. Our organization is run <laughs> by Gen Z. Uh, our, obviously, I'm a millennial. Uh, many members of our team are millennial, but our chapters and our regional hubs, the people who participate in our writing fellows program, the people that we work with to bring all this programming together, they're all in that age demographic and they're all looking for opportunities. Um, sure, they want more money, but they also want connections and they want skills. And that means they want better jobs in the future. Um, so great. Thankfully, <laughs> um, I am not seeing that people uh, don't dream of labor. Um, but one thing I asked some members of my team uh, who are Gen Z about this article and about this quote and something that they said I think is worth thinking about. Um, they mentioned that what they find with among their peers and among themselves is that they do want to take advantage of the blessings of liberty now. They don't want to wait till they're 60. Uh, they don't want to wait till they're retired. They have seen that that hasn't always worked out. Your get, Things are not guaranteed. You don't always have tomorrow. And so they want to be ready to take advantage of the world that we live in today. Um, and I think that that's worth cheering for um, because I think that that speaks to the success of the free market world that no, it's not perfect now, but we live in a world that is 
um, more free than it has ever been. And we're, we have the opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, so yeah, I think we find that young people are still eager to work. They do want to change the world. Um, people used to say the same thing about millennials that we didn't really, we didn't have, you know, the great work ethic, but I think it's more that we want to do work that is meaningful and that is going to change the world. And we want to be treated well in the workplace, which I don't think is such a bad thing. So yeah, no, I do agree with you for sure, Cindy. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just tell you a little bit of my perspective. I have a daughter who is 24 and um, she graduated from college about a year ago. And in the past 11 months or so, she's had about eight jobs, um, like these gig jobs, some that last mm -hmm. a weekend or a couple of weeks, or it's lasted six months, but it's only been, you know, 10 hours a week. And then she's on the side, she's training for triathlons. And then she's, you know, she, she's got something else going. And I find it a little frustrating because I'm like, in my day, the first thing I did when I got out of college or even before was I had a job lined up. Like it was super linear. And mm -hmm. I feel like my daughter is just kind of all over the place. And she's like, well, mom, I, I think maybe it gets to your point, Cindy, that they don't want to do, they don't want to wait till they're 60 to sort of pursue their dreams or their passion or their hobby or interest. Like, I feel like that's what my generation is doing. Like, right. Yeah. We, we sort of, go through the career path, we set aside money. And then someday when we're 50, we might have enough money to pursue that hobby or interest. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that's what I've done. Yeah. Um, but she's like, no, I, I want to live my life now. I mean, do you think that's a lot of what's going on? Yeah, I think so. And I think that we also have to remember that they're graduating into a really difficult world. <laughs> you know, COVID threw everything on yeah. its head. The world that we're living in is complicated. Yeah. Um, and we know that tomorrow isn't guaranteed. So it is time to live for now. Um, and I think it's kind of an exciting thing that, you know, parents, they work to make their kids lives better. And maybe this is the opportunity that you want to give your daughter is that she can pursue a lot of different passions and find what works for her and what is exciting for her. And maybe that's not a serious career, but it's a lot of other different things. Um, and I have to say, this is something that I, I really think is important for all of our audiences to think about is that this, in my mind, this mindset of not wanting to have a difficult hard job is an opportunity for us um, because it is our belief system and our values that are going to create a world where you can have room for leisure. Um, I have the opportunity to do a job that I believe in that is going to change the world. And we want to give that opportunity to as many people as possible. And that only happens through cutting regulation and limiting uh, government. And so I think that we should see this mindset as more of an opportunity because it doesn't come <laughs> from socialism. You don't get to live that life that way. Um, and so I think that it's it's at first you hear that and it's shocking, but then I think it's an opportunity for us to really talk about how um, the values of limited government and personal responsibility can lead to the life where people can enjoy it today and when they're 60 and 70 and 90 and 100. Oh, my gosh, Cindy, I'm so glad you brought it back to that. Thank you so much for reminding us that really the focus of the conversation is looking at what young people are doing to promote the conservative values that in my generation are certainly central to my life. And I'm so happy to see a younger generation, you know, really carrying on with, with the, like you said, the belief in limited government and, and fighting against this encroachment of socialism and big government. Because I absolutely agree that limited government is best for the people. It's the way to maximum freedom and mm -hmm. individual happiness and prosperity. I've seen it in my life. And so I'm so happy, Cindy, that your group is doing this work to help keep those values alive and that there are young people around the country who share those values with us. Yes. Thank yeah. you. It's, it's a great pr privilege and I'm inspired every day by the young people who want to do this work and to bring it to their friends and to bring it to their communities because that's really the key. We got to tell more people about it. So, so people yeah. can go to americasfuture.org. It's on the screen there. And the two big things they want to check out, right, are the, the Buckley Award nominations mm -hmm. where you can nominate someone between ages 22 to 40. Yes. And then your gala, um, I'll let you have the last word. What, what message do you want to leave with people, Cindy? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, if you'd like to submit a nomination for the Buckley Awards, I will give you until midnight tonight because we have to make those decisions and make sure they can get to DC. Um, so head on over to our website and submit a nomination. Please feel free. Uh, if you're in the DC area or you're close by, we'd love to see you on May 26th at our ga gala. It's taking place at the Planet Word Museum. It's going to be a fantastic evening uh, and a great opportunity to meet other like-minded individuals. Um, but really what I want to say, no matter where you are in the country, and America's Future wants to work with you and offer opportunities. So please check out our website, find ways to join as a member to take advantage of our virtual programming or show up to any chapter event or hub event that's happening. They're happening almost every day of the week. Uh, so please make sure that you can join us in person or online. And thank you, Alex, so much for giving me the chance to come and share this organization with you. Thank you, Cindy. It was a lot of fun to talk with you and to hear about what you're doing. Thanks everyone for joining us today and go to americasfuture.org. If you have a nominee for the Buckley Award, you have until midnight tonight to get that in. Yes. So thank you, Cindy. And thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you next time in another Alec TV live stream. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.